Just days after the 2010 Winter Olympics, when Canadians were steaming with excitement and national pride, I found myself in what seemed like a much different world. While news headlines were filled with gold medal counts and fulfilling Olympic dreams, Haiti's death toll from their recent January 10th earthquake was reaching the hundreds of thousands. I was 19 at the time and living the dream, working on the ski hill for a petty wage and freeloading off my parents. <laughs> but something inside of me wasn't quite right. I felt like despite the global aid response, I needed to try and make a difference. At the time, I had no idea where Haiti was, let alone the history, culture, or even the language they spoke. But that wasn't about to stop me. It was a Friday evening when I made the decision that would shape who I am today. My mother was working a night shift at the local hospital when I called her. I can only imagine a mother's response when her 19-year-old son calls at one in the morning and requests her visa card number <laughs> to book a flight online into a developing country in the midst of a natural disaster. In a somewhat supportive tone of voice, her response went something like, are you sure you know what you're getting yourself into? And the truth is, at the time, no. Not at all. I'm flying into a foreign country with nowhere to eat, nowhere to sleep, and nothing but a carry-on bag filled with protein bars and a change of clothes to accompany me. But of course I didn't say that at the time. A week later, I found myself in, a, in an emergency room of a Haitian hospital, working alongside dedicated healthcare professionals from all around North America. We were frantically working to extract an unborn child from the womb of his dead mother by means of a post-mortem cesarean. Despite the best efforts of the team, both mother and child passed away that evening. I left the hospital emotional, scarred, defeated. I just witnessed one of the worst sights possible. But I couldn't help but think back to just a few days prior. I'd been in the midst of a national celebration, living life carefree, as Sidney Crosby scored Canada's game-winning goal. I spent the ensuing weeks working alongside some dedicated, amazing healthcare professionals from all around North America. I witnessed both the tragedies and the miracles the country had to offer. When I returned home, overwhelmed by the sights and sounds I'd seen, it didn't take long to notice that very little had changed since I left. All I wanted to do was share stories of my experiences, and tell, but I felt people just weren't interested, self-absorbed in day-to-day -day life. Haiti caused me to wake up and shift my perspective on what I view as important in the world. I learned identity transcends geography, and that our rights and responsibilities are derived from membership in a broader class, that of a global citizen. About seven months later, I had the opportunity to return to Haiti, this time under the umbrella of a large organization. I was to assist medical professionals in routine mobile medical clinics around the slums of Port-au-Prince. The trip was to be more mellow than my previous experience, and I was looking forward to finally seeing some of the culture Haiti had to offer, but most of all, how far they'd come since the devastating earthquake. But while I was boarding my connecting flight in Miami, a sheet of paper was being passed down the lineup, informing travelers of a recent cholera outbreak. At the time, I had no idea what cholera was, let alone the effects it has on the human body. Cholera is a highly infectious and often fatal bacterial disease of the small intestine attracted through lack of safe drinking water. Symptoms include excessive vomiting, diarrhea, and if not treated immediately, death. I spent the next month working in numerous cholera treatment centers, tracking and treating the disease as it made its way south down the island towards the capital of Port-au-Prince. In that time, I watched families who contracted the disease from the small tarp houses they'd been forced to live in since the earthquake pass away. I learned cholera does not have mercy on the young or the old. It affects everybody in its path. By the time I left Haiti, I'd seen more dying in such a short period of time than anybody should have to see in a lifetime. The horrible cycle of returning home for what can only be compared to as a war zone repeated itself. For days I couldn't eat, I couldn't sleep, and I constantly yearned for the opportunity to return. But while responding to the cholera epidemic, I had the opportunity to meet Dr. Linda Mabula. 
Linda's a postdoctoral fellow at Johns Hopkins Medical Center. She grew up in the Democratic Republic of Congo, where war has plagued the country for most of its existence. While working together, Linda told me stories of her experiences growing up there and some of the histories surrounding her homeland. She told me how while growing up, gun-toting soldiers would break into her family's home and hold them at gunpoint, accusing them of being Tutsis. The ethnic conflict responsible for that of the Rwandan genocide had overflowed its borders and continues to plague the Democratic Republic of Congo to this day. Rape is now used, is the Democratic Republic of Congo is now the most dangerous place in the world to be a woman. It has been named the rape capital of the world for years running. Rape is used as a tactic of war, not only because it affects its victims, but because it tears apart communities as well. The death toll in the Democratic Republic of Congo is second only to that of the bloodshed committed in World War II, with five and a half million people dead. As one could imagine, Linda's description of her homeland had a lasting effect on me. The following year, I decided to travel to the Democratic Republic of Congo to see for myself the devastated country. I traveled to the town of Momosho, a former epicenter of conflict from the past two Congolese wars. It's located in the South Kivu province on the Rwandan-Congo border. The, vill the small villages surrounding Mo uh, Bukavu are home to some of the most affected individuals. The humanitarian crisis in the Democratic Republic of Congo is a multifaceted political nightmare where the true victims are women and children. Rebelling groups freely roam the countryside, raping, killing, and displacing hundreds of thousands of people. This in part due to a lack of authority by an already feuding government. Land and territory is viciously fought over due to extremely mineral-rich east, eastern provinces. Several factors influence the violence, including foreign interest mining groups exploiting the mineral-rich eastern provinces with large-scale mining operations extracting what have now become known as conflict minerals. The negative impacts brought on by these minerals, more specifically coltan, are devastating. When refined, coltan becomes a heat-resistant powder with unique properties in retaining electrical charge, mainly in cell phone technology. And as the international demand for this mineral has increased due to a boom in cell phone consumerism, societies in the Democratic Republic of Congo have experienced heightened economic and physical insecurities, as well as human rights violations. After my first trip to Congo in 2011, I decided to return earlier this year. I wanted to gain more insight into the issues plaguing the country. After forming an unlikely friendship with the former chief of mining, I was fortunate enough and maybe a bit crazy to accept a full military escort into the mountains where I could see firsthand the mining process. I found the workers used very minimal tools. Many had no shoes, no helmets, no gloves, no lights, no supports to protect them from the hundreds of tons of earth above them. The Democratic Republic of Congo continues to supply much of the world's coltan to support Western culture's now intrinsic electronic needs. The country is subject to highly organized and systemic exploitation, fueling the ongoing rebel movement and causing widespread fear among the locals. After I returned home, I decided I needed to take initiative and make a direct impact. In partnership with a local East Con Congolese educator and friend, I founded the Peace Life Project Foundation. The Peace Life Project Foundation aims to educate and empower school-age victims who have been disadvantaged and victimized by the ongoing conflicts in the Democratic Republic of Congo. The Peace Life Project Foundation strives to ensure accountability and transparency from a grassroots perspective. Meet Taboba. I first met Taboba in 2011. When Taboba was seven, he was gathering firewood in the forest surrounding his village with friends. Unknown to them, Taboba and his friends had wandered into a former rebel camp. Taboba stepped on an unexploded grenade, severely damaging his right leg. 
parents were unable to attain the necessary medical attention to address his, the extent of his injuries and due to lack of funds. When I met Taboba, he was using a four-foot metal pole to crutch back and forth to school, severely limiting his attendance due to the severe weather conditions in the Democratic Republic of Congo. He had dreams of one day becoming a doctor, but when I met him, his future wasn't looking all that bright. As Nelson Mandela once said, change is the most powerful weapon which you can use to change the world. So, education is the most powerful weapon <laughs> which you can use to change the world. We need to address conflicts such as that in the Democratic Republic of Congo with school books and education, not AK-47s. My goal is to raise awareness and create change. Current projects include the construction of the Peace Life School in the Momosho district. By educating the youth, we'll be addressing the cause of much greater issues, not the symptoms. The school will be incorporating extra resources to address the psychological needs of the victimized children, as well as gender-based violence and basic human rights education. Ending conflicts such as that in Congo is a slow process involving significant political, cultural, and social change. We hear of disasters and conflicts around the world and we react with a Band-Aid method, but a Band-Aid method does nothing but mask the indicators of a much larger problem. Humanity transcends gender, race, or region. And through my travels, I've learned the importance of drawing from first-hand experiences and developing your own conclusions. My radical shift in perspective came as a result of seeing firsthand the effects of global inaction resulting in millions of lives lost. But change on this sort of scale does not come instant. Rather than aid coming from a top-down approach, we need to be collaborating with the people themselves who will not only see the change, but live it. Empowering these people fosters a society in which the people with the most reason to care will be the ones who implement new solutions. The Peace Life Project Foundation in collaboration with grassroots NGOs from north, north, across North America, enabled funding so Taboba could receive the necessary surgery to continue a successful life. With the successful construction of the Peace Life School, the students like Taboba that the Peace Life Project Foundation aims to educate for an empowered future. Thank you. Oh, that was so good. How can they find your Peace Life Foundation? Where do they find the Peace Life Foundation? Facebook, the best place to find it right now. Peace Life Project Foundation. Okay. Unless there's some web designers in the crowd, then let's talk after. <laughs>